This is Drew with Trust the Process. Let's f***ing go. Let's go. This is Drew with Trust the Process. I know that, uh, I know that that intro was a bit unusual, but, um, but I've been wanting to really, to start editing my videos. So like really start editing my videos. And, um, and I've just, I don't know. I just haven't done it. I've had every excuse in the book as to why, um, I didn't have time to learn or whatever. And I mean, right now there's no excuse. Like you can go on YouTube and learn how to do anything. So I decided to go on YouTube and start watching some instructional videos on how to edit with iMovie on my Mac. And, uh, and now I, uh, now I can put a beep, <laughs> which may not, it may not seem like much to somebody, but for me, like just going into iMovie and, and doing that, um, that's kind of a big deal. But now that I understand kind of the way the, to split and do some other things on there, um, I'm excited because right now it's actually the morning of the 19th. Um, so I'll be making my Taurus season video, which I'm excited about. Uh, I'll be making that probably, I guess, what would be tonight. Um, and uh, so I'd really like to be able to trim that video up and kind of edit it so it's pretty smooth and whatever. Um, we'll see. But whatever. It's just one little thing that, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. So we're gonna continue on here today. Oh man, where where are we at? I think we're chapter four point two. Yeah, that's right, because four point one was kind of crazy. All right, so chapter four point two, Money Master of the Game, by Tony Robbins, playing to win the risk growth bucket. The winner ain't the one with the fastest car. It's the one who refuses to lose. Dale Earnhardt Sr. The risk slash growth bucket is where everybody wants to be. Why? Because it's sexy. It's exciting. You can get much higher return here. You can get a much higher return here. But the key word is can. You can also lose everything you've saved and invested. So whatever you put in your risk slash growth bucket you have to be prepared to lose a portion or even all of it if you don't have protective measures in place. How do we know this? Because everything in life, including markets, runs in cycles. There are going to be up times and down times, and anybody who invests in a particular in one particular kind of asset while it's on its roll, be it real estate, stocks, bonds, commodities, or whatever, and thinks the party will last forever because this time will be different, should get ready for a rude awakening. When I interviewed Jack Vogel for this book, he repeated one of his mantras. Markets always revert to the mean. That means that what goes up is going to come down and vice versa. And I'm sure Ray Dalio got your attention when he said that whatever your favorite investment might be, at some point in your life, you can count on it dropping 50 to 70% in value. While there's unlimited potential for upside in this bucket, never forget that you could lose it all, or at least a significant portion. That's why I call this the risk slash growth bucket and not the growth slash risk bucket, because growth is not guaranteed, but risk is. So what investments would you put in here? Here's a sampling of seven main asset classes to consider. Equities. Another word for stocks or ownership shares of individual companies or vehicles for owning many of them at once, like mutual funds, indexes, and exchange-traded funds, ETFs. Exchange-traded funds, ETFs, have been called the it girl of the stock market, ballooning in popularity by more than 2,000% from 2001 to 2014, and holding more than $2 trillion in investments. But what exactly are they? ETFs are built like mutual funds or index funds because they contain a diversified collection of assets, but you can trade them just like an individual stock. Most of them follow a theme, small cap stocks, municipal bonds, gold, and or trace on index. 
but with an index or mutual fund, you have to wait until the end of the trading day to buy or sell. ETFs can be traded all day long. Experts say that if you like an idea of an index fund, but you want to buy when you see the price is low and sell when the price is high during a trading session, an ETF might be for you. But what's but that's trading, not investing. And trying to time a market brings a very intense and special risk. But there's another difference. When you buy shares of an ETF, you are not buying the actual stocks, bonds, commodities, or whatever else is bundled in the fund. You are buying shares in an investment fund that owns those assets. The company promises that you'll receive the same financial outcome as if you'd own them for yourself. But don't worry, it sounds more complicated than it is. A lot of people like ETFs because they give you a tremendous amount of diversity at a low cost. In fact, many ETFs have lower fees than even comparable traditional index funds and sometimes lower minimum investment requirements. And because they don't engage in a lot of the kind of trading that produces capital gains, they can be tax efficient. Although there is a move toward more actively managed ETFs coming to the market, which makes them less tax efficient. Should you invest in ETFs? Jack Bogle, founder of Vanguard, which incidentally offers many ETF funds, told me he sees nothing wrong with owning broad spectrum index ETFs, but he warns that some are too specialized for individual investors. You can not only bet on the market, he told me, but on countries, on industry sectors. And you might be right and you might be wrong. David Swenson wonders why individual investors should bother with ETFs at all. I'm a big believer in buying and holding for the long run, he told me. The main reason you go into an ETF is to trade, and so I'm not a big fan. High yield bonds. You might also know these as junk bonds, and there's a reason they call them junk. These are bonds with, lowest safety, with the lowest safety ratings, and you get a high yield coupon, higher rate of return than more secure bond, only because you're taking a big risk. For a refresher, go back and read the bond briefing at the end of the last chapter. Real estate. We all know real estate can have tremendous returns. You probably already know a lot about this category, but there are many ways to invest in property. You can invest in a home that you rent out for an income. You can buy property, fix it up, and then flip it in the short term. You can invest in first trust deeds. You can buy commercial real estate or an apartment. One of my favorites that I mentioned to do already is investing in senior housing, where you can get both the income and the potential growth and appreciation as well. Or you can buy REITs, a real estate investment trust. These are trusts that own big chunks of commercial real estate or mortgages and sell shares to small investors, like mutual funds. REITs trade like stocks, and you can also buy shares of REIT index fund, which gives you a diversity of many different REITs. For growth, the noble economist Robert Schiller told me that you're better off investing in REITs than owning your own home, which belongs in the security bucket anyway. Buying an apartment, REIT, sounds to, to me like maybe a better investment than buying your own house, he said, because you seem to be a tilt toward renting now. That could change, of course. And as with any investment, you've got to pause and think, what am I betting on? You're betting that the price of the property is going to go up over time, but there's no guarantee. So that's why it's in the risk slash growth bucket. If it goes up, it could have a nice rate of return. If it doesn't, you get nothing or you could lose it all. When you buy your own home, you're betting that the price of your home will go up. You're going, when you're going to buy real estate that has income associated with it, a rental unit, an apartment building, commercial real estate, an REIT or index that holds these, Schiller points out you have two ways to win. You can make income along the way and if the property increases in value, you also have the opportunity to make money when you sell on the, on the appreciation. For commodities, this category includes gold, silver, oil, coffee, cotton, and so on. 
Over the years, gold has been considered the ultimate safe haven for many people, a staple of their security bucket, and conventional wisdom said it would only go up in value during uncertain times. Then its price dropped more than 25% in 2013. Why would you invest in gold? You could keep a small amount in your portfolio that says, in case paper money disappears, then this is a little portion of my security. You know, if all hell breaks loose and the government collapses under a zombie invasion, at least you've got some gold or silver coins to buy yourself a houseboat and head to sea. On second thought, can zombies swim? Otherwise, gold probably belongs in your risk slash growth bucket. You'd invest in it as a protection against inflation or as part of a balanced portfolio as we will learn later on but you have to accept the risk so don't kid yourself if you buy gold you're betting it will go up in price unlike any other investment there's no income from this investment like you might get in from stocks from dividends or from income producing real estate or bonds so gold could be a risk good risk or a bad one but it goes in your risk slash growth bucket for sure this is not an attack on gold in fact in the right economic season, gold is a superstar performer. That's why in chapter 5.1, invincible, unsinkable, unconquerable, the all-season strategy, you'll see why it can be invaluable to have a small portion of gold in your portfolio. Currencies. Got a yen to buy some yen? Since all currency is just paper, currency investing in pure speculation, there are people who make a fortune in it and even more who lose a fortune. Currency trading is not for the faint of heart. Collectibles, art, wine, coins, automobiles, and antiques to name a few. Once again, this asset class requires very special knowledge or a lot of time on eBay. Structured notes, what are these doing in both buckets? Because there are different types of structured notes. Some have 100% principal protection, and those can go in your security bucket, as long as the issuing bank is financially solid. Then there are other kinds of notes that give you higher potential returns, but only partial protection if the index drops. Say you buy a note with 25% protection. That means if the stock market drops up to 25%, you don't lose a dime. If it goes down 35%, you lose 10%. But for taking more risk, you get more upside, sometimes as much as 150% of the index to which it's tied. And in other words, if the market went up to 10%, up 10%, you'd receive a 15% return. So there's potential for greater gains, but there's definitely increased risk. Remember, once again, structured notes should be purchased through an RIA who will work to strip out all excess fees and deliver them to you in the form of an even greater return. Safety doesn't happen by accident, Florida Highway sign. <laughs> We've now covered a sample of some of the investment vehicles assets that you might find in a diversified risk slash growth bucket. You may be wondering why I haven't included some of the more daring investment vehicles of our time. Call and put in options, credit default obligations, and a whole host of exotic financial instruments available to traders these days. If you build up a lot of wealth, you may want to have your fiduciary look into some of these vehicles. But just realize that if you're playing this game, you're most likely no longer just an investor, you become a speculator as well. It's what's called momentum trading, and you have to realize you can lose everything and more if you play the wrong one. Game wrong. And because the mantra of this book is the road to financial freedom is through saving and investing for compounded growth. I'll leave a discussion of these momentum assets for another day. It's time to get in the, in the game. Okay. Now you know the players that belong in your allocation buckets. And you know the key to building a winning team. Diversify, diversify, diversify. But there's more. You not only have to diversify between your social, between your security and your risk slash growth buckets, but within them as well. As Burton Malkiel shared with me, you should diversify across securities, across asset classes, across markets, and across time. 
That's how you truly get a portfolio for all, for all seasons. For example, he says you want to invest not only in both stocks and bonds, but also in different types of stocks and bonds, many of them from different markets and different parts of the world. We'll talk about diversifying across time in Chapter 4.4. Timing is everything. And, most experts agree, the ultimate diversification tool for individual investors is the low fee index fund, which gives you the broadest exposure to the largest number of securities for the lowest cost. The best way to diversify is to own the index, because you don't have to pay all those fees. David Swinson told me, and you get tax efficiency, meaning that if you're investing outside of your IRA or 401k type account, you don't get taxed for all the constant buying and selling that goes on in most mutual funds. Have some fun. Of course, if you have your money machine in full gear and you have the desire, there's nothing wrong with setting aside a tiny percent of your risk slash growth bucket to pick some stocks and do some day trading. Index your important money, then go have fun, Burton Malkiel told me. It's better than going to the racetrack, but he said, limit yourself to 5% or less of your total assets or portfolio. Is all of this going is all of this giving you an idea of what kind of portfolio mix will be best for you? Before you decide, just remember that we all have a tendency to pile up the investments that we think will give us our greatest victories, and everybody gets victories. You know why? Different environments reward different investments. So let's say real estate is hot. You've invested in real estate. So now you're a genius. Stock market is hot. If you have stocks, you're a genius. Bonds are doing great. If you have bonds, once again, you're an investment master. Or maybe you just landed in the right place at the right time, right? So you don't want to get overconfident. That's why asset allocation is so important. What do all the smartest people in the world say? I'm going to be wrong. So they design their asset allocation ideally to make money in the long term, even if they're wrong in the short term. Let's test your knowledge. In the coming pages, I'll be showing you the portfolios or the asset allocations designed by some of the greatest investors of all time. Let's start with a sample from someone you've been hearing from throughout this book. David Swenson, Yale's $23.9 billion plus man, a true master of asset allocation. Would you be interested in seeing his personal portfolio recommendations? Me too. So when we sat down together in his office at Yale, I asked him the key question. If you couldn't leave any money to your kids, only a portfolio and a set of investment principles, what would they be? He showed me the asset allocation that he recommends for individual investors, one he thinks will hold up against, against the test of time. He also recommends his portfolio for all institutions other than Yale, Stanford, Harvard, and Princeton. Why? because these four institutions employ an army of full-time top analysts. When I saw his list, I was amazed by how elegant and simple it was. I've shown you 15 types of assets to choose from. He uses only six categories, all in index funds. I was also surprised by how much weight he gave to one particular bucket. Can you guess which one? Let's activate some of what we've learned thus far about the division between security and risk slash growth buckets. Have a look at the box below and jot down where each asset class belongs. Check which one you think belongs in the security bucket, where you put things that are going to give you a modest return in exchange for lower risk. And then check which belongs in risk slash growth, where there's greater upside potential but also greater downside. I'll just go ahead and show you that real quick so you can see. I'm not gonna do that right now. Let's start with the top four. The first is a broad domestic stock index, something like the Vanguard 500 index or the Wilshire 5000 total market index. Where would you put it? I have no idea. Does it come with risk? <laughs> Absolutely. Have you got a guaranteed return? Absolutely not. Could you lose it all? Unlikely. But it could drop significantly, and it has at times. Over the long term, U.S. stocks certainly have a great track record. Remember how they compared to owning your, personal, your own personal real estate? Equities have done well over time, 
but they are one of the most volatile asset classes in the short run. In the last 86 years, through 2013, the S&P lost money 24 times. So stock index funds belongs in which bucket? That's right, risk slash growth. How about international stocks? David Swenson puts a lot of weight in foreign stocks because of the diversity they bring to the portfolio. If there's a slump in America, business may be booming in Europe or Asia. But not everybody agrees with David. Foreign currencies aren't as stable as gold, as good old U.S. greenbacks. So there's a currency risk in investing in foreign stocks. And Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard with 64 years of success, says that owning American companies is a global. Tony, the reality is that among the big corporations in America, none are domestic, he told me. They're all over, they're all, all over the world. McDonald's, IBM, Microsoft, General Motors. So you own an international portfolio anyway. Where do foreign stocks belong? I think we agree on the risk slash growth bucket, no? Emerging markets. David Swenson likes to put some money into the volatile stocks of developing nations like Brazil, Vietnam, South Africa, and Indonesia. You can get spectacular returns, but you can also lose everything. Risk slash growth bucket, you bet. How about REITs? David told me he likes real estate investment trusts that own big central business district office buildings and big regional malls and industrial buildings. They generally throw off a high income comp component. So these index funds can generate great returns, but they rise and fall with the American commercial real estate market. Which bucket? You've got it. Risk slash growth. What about the last two on the list? long-term u.s treasuries and tips do they offer low returns in exchange for your safety spot on so which bucket do they belong in you got it security congratulations you've just assigned six major asset classes to their proper allocation buckets which is something 99 percent of people you pass on the street wouldn't be able to do pretty cool thing isn't it but let's dig a little deeper here to understand why david chose this mix and why it may or may not be right for you. First, let's look at the security bucket. David said he chose only U.S. Treasury bonds because there's a purity there and having the full faith and credit of the U.S. government backing them. But why did he pick this particular combination of bond funds? Half are traditional long-term treasury bonds and half are inflation protected securities. I said to David, you're basically saying if I'm going to be secure, I'm going to protect myself against both inflation and deflation. That's absolutely right, he said. I can't believe you saw that. A lot of people who put together bond indexes lump the two together. The treasuries are for deflation, like we had in 2008. But if you buy regular treasury bonds and inflation takes off, you're going to end up having losses in your portfolio. If you buy the tips and inflation takes off, you're going to be protected. I want you to notice that David Swenson, like all the best, doesn't know which is going to happen, inflation or deflation, so he plans for both scenarios. You might say, as you look at this, well, yes, 50% for inflation and 50% for deflation, doesn't he just break even? It's not that simple, but your thinking is quality. He is using his security bucket investment as protection that if his equity investments or real estate go down, he's lowering his downside by having something to offset some of those investment risks. So he's certainly so he's certain to make some money in his security bucket, and he doesn't lose his principal. So he's practicing smart security bucket usage. He won't lose money, but he'll make some additional money if things inflate or deflate. A very smart approach. But I was a bit surprised that only 30% of his asset allocation goes into the security bucket while 70% goes into the risk slash growth bucket. That seemed pretty aggressive to me for some investors. So I asked David how it would work for the average investor. That's a good question, Tony, he said. Equities are the core for portfolios that have a long time horizon. I mean, if you look at recent long periods of time, 10, 20, 50, 100 years, you see that the equity returns are superior to those that you get in fixed income. 
Historical data certainly backed him up. Have a look at the visual on page 332 that traces the returns of stocks and bonds for periods of 100 and 200 years. It shows the U.S. stocks have historically outperformed bonds and compounded annual returns. In fact, a dollar invested in 1802 at 8.3 per annum would have grown to 8.8 .8 million by the turn of the new millennium. So David Swenson designed his ideal portfolio to be a wealth generation generating machine that offers some stability through its tremendous diversity and because it takes a long-term view of investing. It has the time to ride out periodic drops in the stock market. I was curious to see how this asset allocation mix would have fared in the past. Those volatile 17 years from April 1st, 97, when tips first became available, to March 31st, 2014. It was during those years when the Standard & Poor's Index performed like a rodeo bull, yet it dropped 51%. So I had a team of financial experts test its performance against the index during those years. Guess what? The Swenson portfolio outperformed the stock market with an annual return of 7.86%. During the bear market of 2000 to 2002, when the S&P 500 dropped almost 50%, Swenson's portfolio stayed relatively stable with a total loss of only 4.572% over those three terrible years. Like other portfolios heavy in equities, Swenson's took a hit in the massive crash of 2008, but it still did better than the S&P 500 by more than 6%, losing 31% as opposed to 37%, and then bounced back. Note, see the end of this chapter for the specific methodology to calculate the returns. Past performance does not guarantee future results. So ladies and gentlemen, it's safe to say that David Swenson is one of those rare unicorns who can actually beat the stock market on a consistent basis. And in this portfolio, he does it with the power of asset allocation alone. And you have access to his best advice right here, right now. If that was all you got out of this chapter, I think you'd agree it's been worth the time. However, the most important thing to understand is this. Even though this portfolio might do better and be more stable than the general market. It is still an aggressive portfolio that takes a strong gut because few people can take a 35% loss of their lifetime savings and not buckle and sell. So is it right for you? If you're a young person, you might be very interested in this kind of mix because you've got more time to recover from any losses. If you're getting ready to retire, this portfolio might be too risky for you. But not to worry. I'm going to give you several other examples of portfolios in the, uh, in the coming pages, including that one particular allocation mix Ray Dalio shared with me that particularly knocked me off my chair. It was so spectacular that I've devoted a whole chapter to it in the next section. But here's a hint. Its mix was much less aggressive than Swenson's, but when we tested it over the same time frame, the Dalio portfolio had a higher average annual return and significantly less volatility. It's a smooth ride. It may be the holy grail portfolio construction, one that gives you substantial growth with the lowest ratio of risk I've ever seen. In any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing to do. The next best thing to do is the wrong thing. And the worst thing is nothing. Theodore Roosevelt. I'm gonna read that one more time because I stumbled over it and I like that. In any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The next best thing is the wrong thing. And the worst thing you can do is nothing. Theodore Roosevelt. But for now, let's get back to the big picture and look at how you'll decide your own basic numbers. What percentage of your assets are you going to put at risk? And what percentage are you going to secure? Before you make the choice, you have to consider three factors your stage in life, your risk tolerance, and your available liquidity. I just want to see how much farther we have. Yeah, I think I'll split this up into 
I think we'll split this up into two two parts. So we will continue on with chapter four point two. I think this is chapter now I'm losing it. Yeah. We'll continue on with part two of chapter four point two when I return, which I'm probably gonna read some more later on tonight. Um, but I'm going to get back to some more video editing videos um, so that I can really put out some better content or better quality content, I guess you could say. Until next time, I'm going to keep grinding. I'm going to keep moving forward. I will always show the process. I am out.